Um, all right. Hi. Uh, the uh, Penal Code Commission on the revision of the Penal Code. Uh, the Committee on the Revision of the Penal Code is back in session. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining. Uh, just for a quick roll call, Senator Burton is not here. Judge Espinoza? Here. Uh, Assemblymember Kamla Gurdav? Here. Justice Moreno? Uh, here. Dean Richardson? Here. Senator Skinner? Here. Thanks. Okay. Um, so the business for today is that we are going to um, discuss uh, what we heard from yesterday. I would like to, you know, basically go through uh, each of the panelists, each of the panels, hear your reflections, and the goal is to set a handful of priorities for the uh, committee staff to further research. When we're done with that, we'll move on to old business. Um, and Tom Nosowitz will report to the committee on the further research and development that he's done on our business from last, from our last ses sessions. And then we'll conclude with some administrative issues. So unless anybody has any questions or clarification, I am ready to get going. All right, um, I'd like to start actually uh, with uh, Director Bosler, Bos Bosler's uh, presentation. Um, we had originally slated her for only 10 minutes and she went wow. for close to an hour, um, which both given uh, all the pressures and everything that she's under right now, I thought was very generous of her, but also she's obviously very interested and engaged in this issue and probably a good ally for the committee in general. Um, in terms of ideas that she might be able to generate. And I was also interested in what appeared to be um, some positive um, experience. And I'm especially curious to hear from you, Senator and Assembly Member, about um, 678 and using that kind of incentive structure. Um, because my impression from at least the last administration was that 678 was not a super popular um, piece of legislation or got very gummed up by uh, realignment. And in any event, in general, using financial incentives between the state and county governments to um, incentivize particular policies without requiring them, right? The advantage is, is that you're not forcing particular policies down uh, people's throats, especially different counties, uh, but you're giving counties incentives to do things that might be positive for the state. So I was wondering if people thought if reactions to her uh, testimony in general and, and, the, and those issues in particular. I'll let Ms. Skinner go first since she chairs the budget. Yeah. I mean, um, so, um, yes, in general, with the counties in the whole concept of local control, it's better to give them uh, these kind of signals rather than mandating it. But I'll say why it was so important. So, um, uh, and interestingly, there was an effort to undo it earlier this year, and uh, which really upset a good number of us. Um, but the real benefit of it is that the, there are many counties, and I hope that we get um, this data, and we may have already talked about it in an earlier one, I'm not sure, but we need to get a county by county breakdown of charging practices and who is sent, uh, uh, you know, who sends like proportionate to their uh, per capita to, you know, uh, who upcharges in effect, who charges that, that result in people being sent to state prison versus county jail, and also even the DJJ, Department of Juvenile Justice. And that's going to be very helpful because I think you, you'll see and we'll see that there's a big disparity. There are certain counties that are uh, disproportionately responsible for our populations in, these, in either facilities and disproportionate for sure to their population. Um, and that would be far, far worse if we did not have 
um, the, uh, the bill that she mentioned, which I can't remember the name, it was a Leno bill, um, it would be far, far worse because they, because in effect, they are rewarded financially if they do the right thing and they're not benefited financially. And there has been discussion. Um, we've not yet had the, uh, well, I don't want to use any terms. I'll just say there has been discussion that we should charge counties that who, who choose to charge in a way, say, say crime X, that could be in the county jail and they choose to charge it so that it goes to state prison, that we make them pay for the differential between what it would cost in the county jail versus what it would cost in the state prison. It's not been proposed yet or no one has put it forward yet, but there have been many discussions um, amongst uh, those of us in this public safety budget realm about such a concept. But anyway, long and short of it is, that that uh, has very much helped us. We, we would have a far bigger state prison population without that measure. Some of the member Khan Lager Doug? Well, so um, I was glad that she talked about personnel and staffing because, you know, I think many of us have been talking with those individuals about, you know, how do we kind of manage through this and sort of lessen our state um, prison populations, recognizing that, you know, it's also um, uh, an employer of uh, so many people um, who have a vested interest <coughs> in keeping their jobs. And you, you, can't, you, you can't not talk about that. And so um, I was glad that that question was raised because there have to be more thoughts on, just like we're having in so many other sectors and industries, you know, there have to be thoughts on, on, on what that looks like in the future, how folks are either retrained or, and how you are able to sort of compress those numbers in a way that still, still does right by public safety, but also, you know, just doesn't seem so um, aggressive for folks looking at the budgets of our prison system. The smaller proportion of incarcerated folks with these incredibly um, expensive medical needs and the fact that our prisons are turning into quasi, you know, state hospitals, a state health hospitals, and then state mental hospitals um, is also something that is um, draining the state budget. And, and, and we have to figure out how we address that because some folks are in there and they, quite frankly, probably need to be there because that's the best place where they're gonna get medical care. But you, I don't think someone should be in prison because they're sick and that's where they're gonna get the best care. So that's also something that's really important for you know, us to consider and, and, and to think about how to use the penal code to kind of help differentiate those populations. You know, I, I still don't know why someone who's 68 years old and dying of ovarian cancer, you know, and legally blind should, and in a wheelchair, should be in the prison, but she got out, but that's a good example. And then 678. Um, you know, so A, I'm actually, we've asked for an audit through our JLAC committee earlier this year to audit three counties, Fresno, Alameda, and Los Angeles, based on their AB 109 realignment dollars to figure out how those dollars have been spent. Because there's so much, of, there's a variance in terms of what the counties are doing with this. And so it's too much for us to do all of the counties, but I think at some point there has to be a much more granular look at how those dollars are being spent and what counties are doing. You know, I've probably like Ms. Skinner as well, you sit on so many committees with so many different groups because of your bills and you just see that folks are doing all kinds of things. I don't always know that the counties are talking to one another. Some counties seem to be very successful or aggressive or innovative or willing to fail or you're just kind of interested in trying new things and others 
not so much. And it's partially probably because of politics and then partially because of the culture. And you can't really legislate culture. Right. You can't legislate um, uh, legacy. You can't legislate, leg legislate how someone's been trained. You know, you can change your tactics, but if it's the same person with the same biases or the same history, or, you know, that's how they were trained, that's very hard to legislate a difference. Um, and so it's, it's how to use the money to incentivize, but it's also kind of figuring out how to tackle 58 very different ways of seeing people and seeing work. I am doing this bill on probation and there was so much drama around 678. Don't do anything that will change 678. This is what people need. This is what people need. And then I start getting data back from my own county, as I shared yesterday, you know, close to $200 million left on the table. So they don't need it that much or else they would be finding ways to use the money and figuring out how to change the bureaucracies in their system to allow them to access it. So I also think that while incentives are good, people use them as a crutch to cover up the fact that they might not have to change. And, so, if, and, and my, the bill is about sort of shorter probation sentences, which I think is parallel to shorter prison sentences. And then people find all of these ways to say, let's keep it the status quo because I'm not that interested in changing because at some point I'm gonna have to change me because I don't have anything left to change in you. And it's like, how do you meld those very disparate challenges together into something? But so, can I, by some and not others. Can I jump in here quickly? Of course, yeah. So, so um, uh, Senator, or excuse me, assembly person, a significant portion of the um, SB 678 money in Los Angeles County was diverted by our Board of Supervisors to my department, the Office of Diversion and Reentry. We have a significant number of uh, evidence-based progressive reentry programs. So you're shaking your head, so I get that you, you know that. Um, you're our savior in LA. This was just probation. <laughs> yeah, no, hey, I- me, Wait, wait, let me get my wife real quick. Um, <laughs> so, so, um, so, so if you are interested in hearing from our team on how we're using those dollars, I would love to give you that opportunity. We have a director of reentry services. Her name is Vanessa Martin, and she has uh, a really remarkable team of mission-driven reentry folks. Uh, so I'm glad. I'm glad to hear you're aware. That there was some controversy around that money being diverted to us right before I was hired. Um, no, this, well, I'm not even talking about your money. I'm not talking well, about your money. Probation's I'm, money. Yes. Yeah. I'm not we're, talking we're, about your money. We're trying to, I would love for you to get more money, quite frankly. From your lips to God's ears, because we'd like some more of that money. Oh. Um, I just don't, I, the politics around that are, you know, tense. But okay, great. I just want to make sure you knew about us. Awesome. Yep. Sorry, sorry, Your Honor. You're That's right. You had a question? I just wanted to comment on something Nancy and uh, also at Sydney referred to, you know, legal culture uh, in 58 uh, counties. You know, so much depends upon the local legal culture and every county has it. And Peter can attest, even within Los Angeles County, uh, there are different uh, sort of sentencing patterns and expectations of oh, what- and the, and the prosecutorial culture. Well, and you know, we had a, a DA, we're not gonna mention counties, but who wouldn't uh, plea bargain in the Inland Empire? Uh, another county oh, yeah. out there, out there, uh, you know, had a we had to send a legal strike force out there to address their criminal case uh, backlog because of lack of, uh, uh, of plea bargaining. And even uh, you know, at my level on the Supreme Court, you know, reviewing 200 death penalty cases, you could go county by county, and I'm sure certain counties were disproportionately represented. Yes. on the death penalty uh, 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 catalog of cases. So uh, we're a big state. There are many legal cultures all over. And you know, when you're trying to uh, establish or enact a uniform kind of policy that applies to all of them, it's really, really quite difficult. And judges are very, very independent and 
for whatever reason, whether it's it's political or budgetary or whatever, uh, I think that's something we have to deal with. I I, I agree. Uh, Dean Richardson, did you have anything to reflect on here? Just didn't hear you. Yeah, no, I, I heard. I was just trying to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. You used um, my mic. Yeah, this discussion this morning has been <coughs> really interesting. Um, so I'll, I'm just looking at my notes. So both reflecting from this morning's discussion and from yesterday uh, and thinking about the, the thing that struck me the most is something that um, assembly member Kamlanger Dove ended with. Uh, comments to the sheriff and to the individual from, um, uh, I can never remember the acronyms, CDCR, CDCR is that right? Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Uh, which is, what can we do um, with the work that we're doing to both provide the incredibly important services that help people when they're in both the jails and the prison system because we can't leave them high and dry with nothing. And yet, what struck me, which is the thing that um, Assemblywoman Kamlager Dove mentioned, is if, if people are getting such benefit from the services and programming that they're getting in custody, what saddens me so much is that all that money is going to these programs once people are in the clutches of the criminal justice system. And how much better would it be if all of these resources were invested in our communities before people ever get caught up in the criminal justice system, right? Like that, that is something I know that we all think about. And the irony is, right, you can see how much of an impact it has when people are in custody. So why? It, it's sort of like the defund the police movement, right? Like moving resources to the place where they should be and can be most impactful. So I don't know what we can do with regard to the penal code to align those incentives to both not leave people high and dry now that they're in the criminal justice system, but create incentives so that that money, those funds, maybe it's creating some sort of incentive structure where we can reach people earlier because it's obvious, we all know it, right? Like it, if we can provide the resources versus the education, the housing, et cetera, if, if we can deal with the systemic issues that exist in our country, so that people don't end up in the criminal justice system in the first place. That is where I was left after yesterday's discussion. So I wanna say that piece first. And then with regard to what we're talking about this morning, it's true that culture matters. Every county is different. Every individual DA's office is different. Um, what we do in custody is different. So that I, I think that's true. So then my question is, how can we make those differences matter less? Um, Senator Skinner was talking about the incentive structure and, and potentially having people have to pay the difference between what the cost would be at the county level if you're going to send it to the state level. That is a brilliant example to me of how we can think about in the penal code aligning incentives so it doesn't matter that we have a DA's office or a particular county that refuses to plea bargain and is responsible for most of the people, for most of the death penalty cases. It shouldn't matter that that's the case. There should be incentives that create the right type of behavior regardless of who the individual prosecutor might be. And can we do something in the penal code that can help align incentives so it doesn't matter who you are, but rather what matters is what is the right thing to do? And by aligning incentives, we can create the behaviors that we want. So that, I guess those are my reflections, both from yesterday's testimony, which was so powerful, especially the last few, well, all of them actually. <laughs> Each one was so powerful. Um, and then today's discussion. So um, I agree that the big takeaway I felt from yesterday was it was just another 
has really showed how that this is an ecosystem or a system that interstate, county, local, probation, jail, um, and, they, and they don't fit together and they don't align well. And then in the certain circumstances, when they do align well, they do really seem to have um, work much better. And perhaps that there are financial incentives in, it in, in order to make those alignments work. Um, I do have some sympathy for different counties uh, needing to police and have different justice system and justice priorities based on their, where they are and their, you know, their constituents and stuff to some degree. I mean, that's something that is a balance. It's kind of why I like in some ways financial incentives. It doesn't force you to do X, it incentivizes you, but I'm not certain about that. Um, a couple of observations that I had, um, the DJJ example, which we, we sort of skipped over, that was a pure, if you were gonna send a kid to state DJJ, a county has to pay for it. Overnight, DJJ essentially went away. And that is just shocking to me. I mean, in some ways, I wish that there was no, we shouldn't have financial incentives. We should do the right policy because it's the right public policy for criminal justice if it costs a million dollars or it costs zero dollars. But you all of a sudden, you told a county that you, all these super predator dangers that you were sending to the state, now you have to pay for them. Oh, no, they're not super predators anymore. They don't need to go, right? I mean, like really starkly overnight. 678 also had a dramatic effect. I think it reduced probation violations by 30% overnight. And this isn't money that's going into the probation officer's pockets. It's just a, you know, like a structural cultural change. It's, it's, it's stark in a way. And I think perhaps a very powerful tool um, that we should think of whether rightly or wrongly, but I mean, it was, um, so I, I think it's something that we should try to explore a little bit. Um, with jobs, uh, assembly member Kamalagar Dove, I think that that's truly something that we need to, you know, be very sensitive of. Um, I will say that um, CDC, I mean, the CCPOA prison guards folks are very supportive of alternative custody arrangements, actually. They're much better jobs, they're safer jobs, they're not out in the middle of nowhere. They like to take people to this program in Las Vegas. I don't know if anybody has been invited on one of these trips, but it's a um, alternative custody, halfway house type situation. They probably just like going to Vegas, but in any event, um, but they really promote this place. Um, and um, so I think it's something to, to look out for. The medical needs that we that was, that was also brought up, um, obviously a huge expense. We're gonna talk about that, I think a little bit more with long sentences because that's mostly where that, that issue comes in. I think that that's a difficult question too because what, we want to say long sentences and old, very and very old people. Of course, they've committed the most horrible and heinous crimes. So I think that we need to appreciate that. Um, one thing that I think I overlooked a little bit on the medical expense was briefly touched on is the expense of the reception centers. These are the evaluations that when you first come in, that can take up to nine into CDCR, which could take up to 90 days, which is a full medical assessment, a full psych assessment, a full um, risk evaluation, gang status. It's, that is another very expensive part of the life cycle of somebody in prison. And that gets to the shorter sentence piece. Um, but we didn't really get into the costs there, but I, I think that, that that's worth looking at. Um, and um, the county disparities. Um, Senator Skinner, I couldn't agree more. And data, 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 data from the death penalty to probation, to police forces, to crime rates, to, I mean, we'll talk about, we are working very hard on trying to get that data. We'll talk about that administrative part, but couldn't agree more. So, so much is anecdotal. I don't like it. I don't trust it. In fact, this is a good transition to our second um, panel, which I think came up with some counterintuitive things as far as I, as I was concerned um, and shows you the power of data. But before we move on, uh, are we, go ahead, Senator. 
I, I just want to add something because I primarily spoke about, I uh, always forget the bill number, 678, is that right? Yes, 678. Yes, yeah, 678. Mm -hmm. um, so if we were going to look just through the dollar lens, and of course I do that quite frequently just because I'm <laughs> the, the budget chair of that. Good job. Um, a couple things. One, we spend very little on programming. I mean, you, you heard there. So 60, I gave you the detail that's about 66% <clears throat> on staffing and personnel. And while some of the programming is done by CDCR staff, a good amount of it is done by contractors. And then at least a minimum of 30% on health. So if you figure out um, food and facility maintenance, and you can imagine just, just by doing the math, what that is in terms of what we spend on programming. And what happened in the recession is that that all got cut. The programming was the first thing that got cut. So we had a number of years where there was basically no programming within the facilities. So here we are in an economic downturn again. And I think we have um, more, there is more support for the programming <clears throat> due to Prop 57, 47, other things but there's more support from the secretary, from the administration. But I fear that, well, right now, there's hardly any programming. There's basically no programming because of COVID and how long that goes. We may still have no programming for another good year or more. And if we stay in uh, a revenue challenge circumstance, we may face that with no programming. So just from a dollar point of view, alternative custody that would allow us to have the most uh, medically expensive people on Medi-Cal, not on the state dime, would save us the greatest amount of money and allow us to protect programming and would also uh, create potentially better conditions within the facilities. And so I think when we think about alternative custody, we should think about how we how there may be ways to design it so that it is there is a form of supervision but not under the definition that requires the state to cover the full cost so i just wanted to raise that if since uh what our discussion with keely was about a lot of things but on one level on bottom line it was about the finances and the cost of our whole um, system. So just wanted to raise those things. Agreed. Judge Espinoza? Yeah, I'll try to be brief. So when I was supervising judge of criminal, I used to get these um, petitions from the wardens of the various prisons for compassionate release yes. for the, the inmate that um, assembly, Assemblywoman Calmo Col described. Yeah. And, and inevitably, the DA would come in and object. Exactly. Um, I, I, even on cases where the person would die within a week or so of Right. You know, the petition being granted and because there's an increasing geriatric population in the prison system, I'm wondering if we shouldn't be thinking about a way to change that process so that it doesn't require a petition from the sentencing county, but, but some, some tool to go before the parole board to say, look, this person is now 68 blind in a wheelchair with all the conditions. It's very expensive for us to keep them. The public safety risk is very low. Can we parole them without without engaging um, the justice partners in the, in the sending county. I don't know if we can do that, whether that would be popular or not. Well, Michael, Senator, Michael, yeah. can I speak to that? I was just about to say, you have your- Direct experience, but- Yes, exactly, go I, ahead. I'm going to uh, not comment about- I will. Okay. Our, no, I'm not even about our current uh, uh, budget trailer bill. I'll just leave that on the table for now. And I'll just say that part of our, um, part of the data we should get is how many people have in fact been released under the compassionate release rules, the medical release rules, and the elderly release rules, because they all pretty much follow a similar, they all have to uh, have some level of judge or DA review. And so the legislature has put those things into statute. Um, at, for many of them now, it's been, say, uh, minimum six years upwards to eight or more years that it's been in statute. And the expectation was, uh, you know, a, a certain number. 
that has never been realized. Now, that said, I don't know if changing it, um, well, I would support, of course, changing it. I'm not sure it would, uh, we would be able to get that through statutorily. And so I think that's an important thing. At some point, we can talk about the dynamics of what changes are possible if, if we have to change them statutorily. But this is why I raise having some form of alternative custody, because we may find that there would be less objection right. if, we, if there was assurance that these folks were not just being released, right? And yet we still, they were no longer within our prison system, but there was some, and I say supervision advisedly because I know that I'm, I don't remember exactly what the, but if we, it, depending on the level or the def definition of supervision, then the state must bear all of the cost. But right. there can still be a form of supervision where we don't. And that's what I think we'd want to think about how to construct. Um, I agree. And furthermore, what Judge, Judge Espinosa, what Senator Skinner was referring to is that butter, budget trailer bill that she was responsible for included several actually, I thought, relatively modest changes to medical parole and got killed um, in the assembly, I think, by... Well, it's Jackson. not dead yet. It's just not okay. been put it on. It's, just it's, not it's, been, been, it's been stalled. Yes. A wet blanket has been placed on it uh, for the time being. We worked. Yeah, so my point is, is that, yes, I think that there is some attention to it. Even still, it's small. Um, the other point that Senator Skinner... And it did not change the fundamental process. It just... Yeah. It just expanded the possibility of the population. Because do you have and so even expanding the possibility of the population so far, now again, this may still get through, but it may not result. The irony is yeah. it may not result in any in any increase in actual uh, medical or elderly releases. And in fact, it was only elderly, it wasn't medical. <laughs> Yeah, the, the <laughs> irony is the petitioner died, but this case is still pending. Right. Yeah. Right. So, well, the other issue is people just get so we've talked about this briefly. Yeah. You know, violent offenders, sexual offenders. You know, there's just narrative out here that even if you're, you know, aged and blind and decrepit and ailing, that you still somehow have complete capacity to wreak havoc yeah. on the yeah. world because it's just this negativity inside of you is so ingrained and probably has like grown while you're in prison. And all you need to do is get fresh air and you will be back in business creating these heinous right. crimes. Even and from right. a wheelchair, from a wheelchair, you'll do it. And on the data, I, I do want to move on a little bit because we're sort of straying and we will get to these long sentences and parole um, at a later date. I also want to just flag, there are probably the same racial problems and geographic problems that are, you know, plague other, every part of the system. Um, I do want to make sure that we don't miss um, something that S Senator Skinner said that I thought was, I'd never heard before and is a really creative idea, which is, which he's referring to is that uh, Obamacare and Medi-Cal will not pay for prisoners, does not pay, that is the state's business. Now, if you are released, then you get Medi-Cal, and then there's this gray area if you're in a halfway house or alternative custody, and I think there's a dispute within the state and the budget, but whatever, then you are potentially eligible for the federal health care. We always talk about, or we usually talk about alternative custody at the front end as a sort of probation thing, but maybe it's curious to, and, and in reentry piece. But we don't really, I've never heard about to talk about in this kind of more of end of life period. Um, anyway, I think that that's worth exploring. But in general, to move, to move on, um, it sounds like, and I don't want to speak for everyone, that there is continuing interest in trying to explore these financial incentive programs um, in ways that we might be able to leverage them toward in the 670, well, I'll call it 678 concept in different areas. And is that something that's, we'll identify that as a priority for the staff. Is there any comment or 
disagreement about that or further direction on that piece. Okay, thank you. Moving on to the second panel, which were the, um, was the data presentation. The takeaway there, which was surprising to me, and in some ways in contrast to the second panel, which we'll get to, I mean, excuse me, the third panel, was that the outcomes for people serving time in jail for the same crimes, controlled for as many different factors as possible, were better than the outcomes served in prison. I think that if that's robust and it's not published yet and we should, you know, look under the hood and, you know, I want it. But first of all, it says a lot about realignment that I don't think anybody ever intended. A lot good about realignment. Um, and seems to suggest that moving people, incarcerating people as locally as possible you know, from prisons to jails and from jails to alternative custody ends up with better public safety outcomes and reduced incarceration because the people in jail also had half the sentences of half the time served relative to the people in prison. I was shocked because as the next panel said, this is anecdotally, but almost 100% of my clients prefer state prison to county jail. County jail, you can't go outside, there's no windows, it's, le I mean, you don't have to spend a lot of time in county jail. I mean, prison isn't great to begin with, but, so I was curious about how people reacted to that, and my takeaway was maybe we should consider, you know, realignment 2.0 or however you want to frame it to try to keep on further the pressure from the states to the localities. I know that the sheriffs and everybody is, you know, like I said at the end, no good deed goes unpunished. But if it is true that they're getting better outcomes, incarcerating fewer people for less money, that's like our sweet spot. So I was curious what people thought about that. Well, I think you're right. The opposition will come from the sheriffs because in Los Angeles County, for example, <clears throat> the, the realignment has resulted in so many folks in the county jail that when a judge puts someone on probation and gives them a year in the county jail, they serve about 15 days or some ridiculously low number um, because of population management issues. So. Um, I agree, which is why I asked the question, but LA was part of their study. No, I know. And they got better outcomes. So I was surprised. In LA, and you're absolutely right. LA, it's shocking. You serve 10% of your jail sentence with no more than 30 days. Yeah. Unless it's a, a realigned offense, but right. if you have one of these split sentences or a misdemeanor sentence, it's, it's, so it's right. very little time actually behind bars. And yet, yeah. they're part of the study and had to dominate the study, of course, because they are by far the largest county. Right. So the, the anecdotal evidence is that the AB 109ers in LA County are the only ones actually serving their time, right? Yeah. They, they go in, they get their time, they get their conduct credits and they get out like you would expect everybody, but the, the probationers and whatnot. Um, I, I have some data on that. That's not an anecdote, that's real. Yeah. And that's in the study about the money too, so it is real. Yeah. yeah. Well, Interesting. I think we have to, you know, wait till they give us the data and look at it real carefully, because um, anyway, I just think there may be other things that we would surmise from it when we look at it, uh, you know, get in the weeds on it. But it, it may just demonstrate. I mean, it's when we say when the probationers, I mean, these are people who are just put back in because of a violation, right? Well, no, they may have been sentenced to three years of formal probation in a year in the county jail, right? That's their plea bargain, uh, their uh, agreement. Okay. And they just check them in and check them out. Okay. But what this may really tell us is just 
that how how uh, how incarceration doesn't work. In other words, that because um, the very little bit of time, I mean, clearly I would guess it's the people with very little time that they spent in the county jail. And that's the other thing I'd want to look carefully at. If you spent a long, long time in the county jail, maybe it's a different story, but that maybe it's really an indicator that uh, the theory that some t that somehow either time, you know, if you're from a punishment point of view or if you're from a rehabilitative point of view, either way, it doesn't matter. Time does not benefit from a public safety outcome. And I don't, I can't make that conclusion yet, but certainly when we look at the data, we have to look carefully at that. Right, and they only looked at five crimes. I mean, they were common crimes, but mm -hmm. abs absolutely, the common denominator might not have been jail versus prison, but just might've been like twice the time versus half. Um, so yeah, I thought that that, I, anyway, I was really struck by it. I also thought that the Butte County Sheriff, it sub resonated to me that the local authorities have a different investment in the outcomes than some CDCR um, staff or in Susanville, you know, who's trying to help out a guy who's going down to San Diego. Maybe it doesn't matter in a big county like LA, but it just, that it, there's something resonated there with me about local responsibility for the rehabilitation and that the outcomes were, were better. Uh, Dean Richardson, I saw, it looks like you had a thought. No, I just wanted to agree with everything that Senator Skinner just said. I was just nodding <laughs> everything that she just said. Um, a, a note on the politics piece. Um, what I hope that we can proceed as a committee is that we can think of policies that we think are the best policies from our consideration. Once we develop, once we have come to some sort of consensus around what we think is a good policy, then I think the second step is how do we make it good politics? And rather than don't let the politics interfere with the first step of trying to think about what's the best thing for the state. And if we can't get past, I don't wanna suggest policies that don't go anywhere. Of course, that's, that's worthless. Um, but I hope that we can, sort of for the, some portion of our conversation, put the politics aside, think about what's the best policies to get the best outcomes. And then once we've come around that, if we have to whittle it down, that's fine. I'm, compromise is good and you know I believe in it. Um, but let's not try to let it interfere with what we think is the best policy at, at the out front. Of course, going down a road that's completely politically inviolable is, a waste of time, but um, so anyway. But I do think it makes sense to get some data on the proximity issue <clears throat> because I actually do believe that folks are better served when they're closer to home in, in, in whatever that looks like. You know, you're, you're more able to connect with your children, your family members, resources that actually are supportive. And I would hate to say that based on anecdote and what I've seen. So I don't know if there is some data out there that suggests that, which doesn't necessarily mean what, what Mia and, um, um, and her partner shared. But I think there's something, I mean, many of us have probably visited halfway houses and the transitional homes and, cause I think we could spend some space, some time in that space as a state. I I agree completely. As somebody who does a lot of reentry work for our folks, if you're not in the t in the community where you're at, it's your kind of hope. You're 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 at the whim of Google, really. But if you live in your community, you know who's good, you know who's bad, you know where is this space. Um, so th that makes a lot of sense to me. Okay, so uh, without moving too quickly, I don't know if people have further thoughts. Of I thought that their presentation was excellent. I want more of their data. Um, a lot of the race stuff I thought was interesting. The geographic disparities, I understand that they want to try to not offend their partners. Um, I would, the, another thing is published yet. So we should all know and thank them for like, you know, as academics to, to present, especially publicly, uh, data and results that have not yet been aired is, really a privilege. So thank them again. 
And I, let's, you know, I want to dig in with them to the numbers some more, maybe help get them more numbers or help them consult with the numbers that we get on all of these fronts. I thought that they were very um, savvy on a lot of this um, and, 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 and came up with counterintuitive. And I also want to see the magnitude of the results. You know, those bar graphs were a little bit confusing to me. That's why I had them go back over. You know, like, okay, it's better. How much better? And then they said it's a percent of a percent. And I was like, um, so, you know, to, sh to, to make a, a giant shift to criminal justice policy based on a couple of percentage points here or there that might be driven entirely by LA County, we should watch out for, uh, with all due respect. <laughs> um, but I think that, again, as far as an action item, consensus to Go back uh, to, the, to uh, those guys as much as they're willing, have them walk through the data, open up the hood, and still further interrogate the data. But I sense a little bit of um, more skepticism than perhaps that I had about, or maybe not, about exploring possibilities in different ways that we could push responsibilities from the state to the counties. Again, putting aside politics, putting aside money for a second. Maybe we're not ready to reach that conclusion or are we like, maybe that is the right way to go. Senator? I'm not. I'm not ready to reach a conclusion. Not that I am opposed to it by any means, but I'm not ready to meet the, reach the conclusion. Um, uh, but I was very intrigued by the data and I really will look at it with a very open mind. Um, uh, yeah. I, I agree, I was, fl I, would have, I would have guessed the opposite, just so. Oh, I would have too, yes. Yeah, I mean, that's what's cool about data. Yeah. So um, I guess the answer is more and more data. And this really piqued our interest. And uh, let's try to get in with them. Um, of course, it came almost in direct conflict with the experience, the, you know, the lived experience. So moving on to the next panel of the folks who actually were incarcerated in the county jails, which is you know, the anecdotal things that we all hear about how horrible they were. Um, I was curious about people's reactions to the, to the next panel. And that was James King, Aaron Fisher, Bridget Cervelli, and the folks from the Inspector General's office in LA. Well, I think for me, it just reinforced the mental health component of all of this. Um, Bridget was, she's still very traumatized from her experience, from her history. Um, and what we are doing, I mean, I think it's very telling the difference in treatment and assessment <clears throat> from the, between prison and jail. Um, but I think we have got to recognize how traumatizing an experience it is and that it just doesn't actually start or end with the incarceration, the visits to the courts, the probing into your life, the constant checkups. I mean, all of that plays a toll. And so you have got to just, you have to address the mental health component to all of this and how long you're tethering people to a system and what the outcomes are that you want and what the outcomes are that you're getting but she represents hundreds of thousands of people who are walking around traumatized. Not to mention what uh, Mr. King said was that you get traumatized before you even commit your crime to begin with. Um, yeah, mental health is huge. The data that I've seen and I can share it is even worse or more stark than what was presented about 50%, it's, and, and, and this, is a, this is another data question about how you count. Um, CDCR actually plays a little bit of a game here, maybe that's too strong a word, about how to count um, who's mentally ill. 
So just to give you a sense, CDCR says between 25 and 30% of the people in CDCR um, are receiving, have a mental health diagnosis and receiving treatment. That's not the way that the federal um, Department of Justice counts mental illness in uh, custody. They say, have you ever received mental health treatment in the past year? So CDCR takes a snapshot of today, who's receiving treatment today, and they say that's between 25 and 30% on any given day. And of course, people cycle in and out. And, see, and the federal, the way that the federal counts of is, have you been in the past year, in the past 12 months? And that catches a much bigger number of folks. Um, so if in CDCR, if you just walked out of treatment yesterday and they count it the next day, you're considered not mentally ill. Um, and by the federal standards, over 50% of people in state prisons suffer from a diagnosable mental illness that requires treatment and close to 70% of county people in, in county jails. So numbers are extreme. Um, and I think that you're right, Assemblymember Kamagardov, that um, getting effective treatment in custody is an oxymoron. Um, so, but, but at the same time, there are very few community programs. Hospitals are not prepared, equipped, or interested in really helping these folks. Um, and, and this is a big, big, very complicated, um, problem. Anyway, do other people had uh, reactions from the oh. panel. So let me just give you a brief summary of what's going on in Los Angeles County because Max Huntsman is the OIG from LA County. Um, as you know, the jail census was reduced by a third in response to the COVID pandemic from 17,000 inmates to roughly 12,000. The problem is that the mental health population, which was around 30% of the population, pre-pandemic is now closer to 50% because those folks were not getting released at the same rate as the general population. Um, we, I think today we still have around 4,000 inmates in the LA County Jail that are considered mental health patients because they are in mental health housing and receiving psychotropic medication. Um, two things have happened in response to that, that reduction that I think are noteworthy. Uh, the um, Board of Supervisors created a work group, which I am the co-chair with, with the Sheriff's Department to study the reduction. I'm on this penal code committee hearing. Oh. Um, it's... I think you might, there you go. Um, to, to, and come up with strategies to keep the census at 12,000 or lower. The second thing that the board instructed us to do was to create a plan to close Men's Central Jail within the next year. Um, and I... <laughs> You talk about an uh, uncomfortable arranged marriage. I'm leading that work group with the sheriff's department um, who are not particularly um, enthused about closing the county jail. Um, the, other, uh, the only other thing I will say about the mental health population is everything that we've been doing in LA County has been through a racial equity lens. And we have had a lot of experts testify either to the alternatives to incarceration work group or in, in the context of these work groups now, the, the LA County jail population is, is vastly overrepresented by African-American men. Right? They're, they're more African-American, they, they, they're disproportionate to their population in the county. When you look at the mental health population, that number uh, gets worse. Um, and so our team did a study of the mental health population through a racial equity lens. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to send that report to, to the staff of this committee so that it can be shared with um, the members of the committee. I think, I, I don't know that maybe it's not the proper venue for, for this, this committee, this commission, but I think we should be looking at some of this stuff through a racial equity lens um, because, because in fact, the whole country is, right? Um, I don't know. I don't know what you do with the penal code to impact disparity in arrest and incarceration, but it seems to me that that's one of the things that Governor Newsom 
said to us at our first meeting was that um, we should be sensitive to racial disparities. So um, I'm going to I'm going to try to get that report sent to you today. Um, I'll send it to Tom. Does that makes sense. Um, the, the, the governor absolutely said that. I mean, I think that we all share that in general as a racial equity priority with criminal justice. Um, it's something that I've thought about even in the incentive arena that we were talking about a second ago. Do you punish a county financially because they've sent a disproportionate number of African Americans or, you know, I don't even know if that's legal, but I mean, you can really, let's we be creative about, or maybe if it's just, you know, again, back to the data, sometimes the transparency of the data itself creates culture change. Well, the, the, the governor has been using financial uh, punishments with COVID for counties that aren't doing what they're supposed to do. I mean, we can I think do that. that. I think all, all these things are on the table, but I think that you have no disagreement whatsoever, Judge, that racial disparity is a huge priority. And that, of course, going back to the panel from, uh, from, the, from the data panel, you know, they said, the data doesn't quite match up. <laughs> they were saying was that black people were getting longer sentences and had better recidivism rates. And they were like, that's curious. Why do black people uh, do better but get harsher punishments? The data doesn't correspond. And I, you know, I don't want to be glib about it, yeah. but I think it corresponds perfectly. Um, so mental health is huge. And maybe Tom, when we get to the collaborative courts piece, I'm very curious about, you know, mental health courts are probably the most pr prominent collaborative courts um, model. We hear a lot about it in the news, Judge Espinoza, about the collab, about mental health courts in Los Angeles County. I don't know. Again, I want to know the data. How many folks? Is it working? Is it not working? Well, I can turn myself into a witness today if you'd like. Um, well, if, could you give us, I mean, maybe when sure. we get to the collaborative. Sure. So yeah, can ahead. we just throw out some quick numbers? Over the last five years, we've removed over 5,000 inmates from the jail and placed them either in community-based restoration programs, which were referred to yesterday, or uh, interim and permanent supportive housing. We currently have around 2,200 former inmates who suffer from a serious mental illness in our housing. Okay, and our housing reminders. provides treatment and care. So it's, it's not just get them out and wish them luck. I mean, we're, it's a very intensive collaboration. And what um, legal mechanism do you use? Have they gone through a collaborative courts process or has they just been assessed? Yeah, they do. So we've established what are called ODR courts in uh, countywide. We started in the Central District with this assistant supervising judge of criminal and became so popular, he expanded the program without really consulting with the board of supervisors, which sent everybody into a tailspin because we were now chasing down resources. But we have um, felony pretrial courts in three different um, locations and all 12 geographic districts feed cases into those three hub courts. Um, and we're getting people out all under probation supervision many of whom were on their way to state prison for their offenses. Um, mostly serious and violent offenses because that's kind of what's left in the county jail. Um, lots of assaults, robberies, uh, criminal threat cases, but all sort of um, as a result of some sort of psychotic condition, right? Some sort of mental illness. And everybody has recognized and, and our, our largest partner in this work is the current VA. Um, which is a message that, that isn't always communicated well, but we're getting all kinds of people out on serious cases because her office is cooperating with us um, in a very big way. And I would love post-pandemic um, for this committee to come to Los Angeles and watch one of our felony pretrial courts in action and see how sick people are when they come in and get released to us and what they look like at their progress reports. Um, after they've been medicated and 
you know, one of our secret sauces is we use injectable medications with this population for the most part. So instead of fighting with them to take their pills every morning, you give them a shot, 30 days later, you give them another one. Um, it's expensive, there's no question about it. It's more expensive than pills, but it is truly, uh, and I'm gonna stop here because literally I have about a three hour stump speech and I feel like I'm launching into it. Um, it's well, truly the key to our success. So when we, when we get to collaborative courts, I'll be able to give you some witnesses from LA that I think will be helpful. That, that would be terrific. Also, of course, the way that we've cut up the system this year and maybe later we take it, we haven't done a series on mental health. Like that obviously could be a whole day's presentation. Instead, we've tried to march through the system a quite of, of a different way. I really do think it is along with race, the big problem, very difficult culturally, very difficult programmatically. Um, and um, I want to definitely hear more about what's working, especially yeah. uh, in, in LA. Um, with uh, getting back to this panel though, um, big takeaway, I agree that mental health is a huge priority, figuring out how to maximize that, minimize the damage that incarceration does towards mental health. Um, were there other issues that people took away from the panel, the second panel? All right. Yeah, assembly member Kamala Gadog. No, I was saying second panel or third panel. Well, uh, Keely, I guess, is not really a panel, so. I'm talking about the panel with Mr. King Jane, Fisher. Jane King, right. <coughs> um, any other comments on that panel? I I want to go back to the mental health thing for a minute. <clears throat> I yeah, think that in our data quest, I think it is worth it. While we are obviously have to, uh, our job is to do the penal code review. I think we have to look at what else may be contributing. And um, I, I have to say this carefully because I, optimally, I want programs with full services for everyone who has mental health challenges. But I'm also, I don't even wanna call it a realist. I'm just, I mean, look how long this has been debated. Look, we have, um, we have, uh, statewide propositions that have passed we've you know quote unquote put a lot of money towards it so when so how come we're still worse off than ever and i think if we go back to housing i think that we're going to find we're worse off than ever because of a lack of housing and every uh, all the um professionals i've spoken to i mean this is why the housing first model has become or the housing first approach has become so uh, uh, a litany for so many people is that if just having housing alone reduces the addictive person, uh, their, the severity of their addiction, it does not necessarily get rid of their addiction, but just for example, just the roof over their heads can cause them to, to eat more frequently and what the data has also shown, if they eat more frequently, they use a little less. And the, again, that roof over their heads may lessen the uh, outbreaks, the whatever, the psychotic episodes. And um, I think we need to look at the correlation between the rise and the number of people with mental illness in our prisons and jails with, with a variety of other indicators we should get data on single room occupancy hotels, the, lo the loss of them and when, you know, and uh, boarding care homes and maybe just affordable housing in general. But I think it's worth it because um, just housing, even without services, may be a lot, lot cheaper, obviously, and a big uh, advantage to dealing with this problem that we are facing. But anyway, I just think that we should get some other data to help us because if we only look through one lens, then we're only going to be applying one set of uh, factors to. 
I agree. This is the elephant metaphor, right? That if you're only looking at the trunk of the elephant, you only cure, you know, the problem. I do think, and I would be curious about to hear from Judge Espinoza, is that does the fact that somebody is in the criminal justice system because they've been arrested for committing a crime give the state or give us, and maybe this is an overly paternalistic view, some help, meaning, okay, you have to take your medication now. We're, we're, the, we're the state, we're, you can go to prison or you can, we can give you an incentive to like get out, but would these guys be getting their medication and the services that you're providing if they weren't in the, if they weren't picked up? So, so the response to that is largely um, has to do with our mission and why we were created. We were created to re reduce the mental health population in the jail. That was so our clients are in the jail, have a history of mental illness and a history of homelessness to 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 address your point, Senator Skinner. And we place them in housing with services. And the Rand Corporation did a study of our um, felony pretrial population and determined that after a year with us the housing retention rate was 70%, which is a huge number for really sick folks. And the recidivism rate defined by a new felony conviction was 14%, which is a very low number. Yeah, so we are a proven model in Los Angeles County, there's no question. We're also cheaper than the county jail. We can provide this service for about $40,000 a year per person, um, as opposed to the cost of incarceration, which in the county jail is very high. Um, and then let me try to answer the second part of your question. What we have found is, as people term off of probation that have been in our housing for three years, they stay with us. And, and our county has made a commitment to provide permanent supportive housing to people that we take out of the jail, even when they're no longer under supervision. And we have a high percentage, we're collecting data right now, of people who choose to stay with us because many of them for the first time in decades have a roof over their heads, Senator Skinner, which is to your point. Um, and they stay, they stay med compliant. We continue to provide them services as long as they stay with us. And it's really um, a question of developing the resources. And that's, that's the, the tension right now in Los Angeles County is really developing additional resources to further reduce the mental health population in the jail. But I don't know that we could work with them if we didn't first have the incentive of getting them out of the jail, right? I mean, that's their incentive, right? Um, but I will tell you that um, we, we did a video that I'll try to find and send to the committee as well, where, where a couple of our participants were interviewed and one of them had a 30 year history of state prison incarceration and, um, and homelessness and he had never had a place of his own. He, he came out of, I think he came out of foster care, I don't remember the, his teenage story, but he'd never really had a place. He's been with us now for about five years and his supervision ended a couple of years ago and he's still with us, he's still taking his meds, he's still med compliant and he hasn't recidivated at all. Um, so I think it's a promising practice, but um, the, the, the politics of shifting resources away from jail and to a care first model, which is the, the new mantra in Los Angeles County, it's care first, right? We are, we're doing everything to create a, a system of care that um, makes incarceration unnecessary, but um, it's unlikely that I'll live to see it to fruition. I mean, it's really, it's really a heavy lift. It's really, it's going to take a sea change um, to create a system where we catch people before the police catch them, because when they're when they're as sick as they are and homeless, they inevitably come into contact with law enforcement. It's just a, a fact of life, an unfortunate fact of life. So. One thing that we I didn't wanna, get into. Go ahead, go ahead, Dean Richardson. Oh, I, I just wanted to jump in to both say why I'm not saying much right now, uh, and it's because I would sound like a broken record, um, because. What Judge Espinoza just said and what Senator Skinner said, I think is, and, and what you said about, is it paternalistic to say that somehow, you, you didn't phrase it quite like this, but what I took from it is being criminal justice system involved can help people get the resources, the housing, the rehabilitative services 
that they need. Um, and care first would be the way to go, right? Like if, if we could just do it in the opposite way. And, and, and that's where I keep coming back to every time I hear each one of you speak, because it just makes the most sense, though sadly, the culture in this country seems to be right now, criminal justice system involvement, right? And, and ironically, once people are in the system, they get the resources, the help, the housing, the programming, right, that we, I think, all wish would happen initially before criminal justice system involvement happens. And so then we're back to the question, so what do we do? And I have no idea what the answer is because of that elephant analogy that you raised. So I, I just felt the need to, to say all of that because we know what works, it sounds like, right? Just based on experience, what Judge Espinoza was saying. I mean, it's amazing. Well, and the other thing I'll say is the Alternatives to Incarceration Work Group, which submitted its report to the Board of Supervisors in March, had 144 recommendations um, along the intercept model, right? How to, how to help people at various stages of uh, their involvement in the criminal justice system. And the first two or three intercept points are before law enforcement contact. Um, and it's a very informative report. Um, I think the staff already has it. I think I'm, I got them copies of it. Um, but it addresses, um, to your point, Dean Richardson, the whole idea of let's provide care and avoid the criminal justice system altogether. Um, but, and there's a lot of work going on in LA County around that report outside of my department and the work that we do for people who are incarcerated about um, how, to, how to lift up those sorts of interventions. You know, we, the reason why I also asked about can we use the criminal justice system is obviously because that's our lens, that's our mission, that's our part of the elephant. But then I was just thinking, well, wait a second, our part of the elephant could be, no, uh, we want the penal code, we're going to explicitly write the penal code out of this problem, perhaps with financial incentives. In fact, my office was responsible for legislation that ended up going nowhere with Senator Bell that said it was explicitly a 678 model. If you can prove that you've reduced the number of mentally ill people in prison and jail, you get money to give more treatment in the community. Um, didn't go anywhere. Um, but something, maybe there's something like that. We think, oh, we'll use the criminal justice system as a hammer and incentive and hammers and sticks and whatever, but maybe the answer is less criminal justice is the, is the criminal justice reform. I don't know. We, I want to hear a lot more about what's going on in LA, Justice Espinoza. I know you're a whole state and basically country onto your own, uh, but it seems like you're onto something, uh, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, I also do think that we're going to need to confront, switching gears a little bit, um, to the, if only anecdotal, but severe reaction to jail, confinement as anything positive versus prison. I mean, the data, like I said, seems to indicate that the jail sentences were kind of working at least better than prisons. Um, and uh, maybe, I don't, we're just going to have to hear from more folks who have been through it, um, try to interrogate the data a little bit more, but uh, I am very cautious to anything that promotes more, you know, my initial reaction to realignment is like what you're taking people and putting them into a worse situation, but if they're getting better out, well, anyway. Um, all right, with regard to this panel, are there other thoughts or concerns or issues? Okay, so the big takeaway for me, it seems from this panel is, you know, really concentration on mental health, um, consequences, especially the short term. Are we doing work more harm than good? How might we incentivize the program to further alternatives and to look more into the LA uh, model? Yes, okay, in terms of priorities. All right, the final panel was uh, CDCR and the Buchanan County Sheriff. Um, 
my experience, sheriffs have been very reluctant to the reform agenda, but I was really encouraged by uh, Sheriff Honey, and um, I sincerely believe that we can, and I hope that we can find common ground. Um, and um, in general, he seemed to support, at least in his county, a lot of the things that we've already been talking about in alternative. You know, it was interesting, you know, at the end, right, he, he was forced into doing the alternative custody. He, he, you know, he plotted the alternative custody program that he had and he thought it was great and he wants more of it. And then, and then well, how did it come about? Well, because realignment shoved it down our throats, right? So um, I thought that was interesting too. Uh, however he got there, maybe it doesn't matter, seems that he at least embraced moving people from incarceration and towards supervised release and and treatment um anyway that's what struck me i was also a little um candidly disappointed with um some of cdcr's um appreciation for their role in this. Of course, they want to see that they're doing a good job. Um, but it didn't seem like they had a good answer or good, you know, they talked about alternatives to incarceration too that they're working on. Uh, it is tiny, it is infinitesimal. The alternative custody program that he referred to has, as far as we can tell, had no more than 100 people ever in it, you know, out of 200,000. Um, the MCRP program, which is kind of a halfway house program, um, is bigger, has between 1,500 and 2,000, but again, tiny. Um, so anyway, those were my reactions. I don't know, other, uh, other people chime in on the final panel? I'll just say with regard to your observations, I agree, especially with the sheriff, and I think it, it, uh, demonstrates the importance that we've already talked about of, of incentives, right? Because people don't know what they don't know. We all start out with our own pre-existing stereotypes and beliefs about what works and what doesn't. Um, and so the sheriff would not have done some of the programming that he's now fully behind without realignment. And it demonstrates, I think, the importance of the data gathering that we're doing because so often we can be impacted by testimony of sheriffs and others who are involved in the criminal justice system. And yet when we come and testify, we are, we are basing our testimony on the experiences we've had. And so I, I think what that means is, and we're already doing this, paying more attention to the data and still taking seriously people's testimony based on their experiences, but relying more on the data. Because had the sheriff come in before realignment, his testimony would have been very different. And sometimes we just don't know what we don't know. So I, I guess that, that's what struck me the most, which is why all of the data work and hearing from the researchers who are coming in is so incredibly important and may trump the testimony that that people might have based on the experiences they've already had right because i don't know if that's making any sense at all but i was really struck by the sheriff because he would have come in and testified differently probably before he was forced to do this new program and now is a proponent so hopefully that makes sense senator skinner i was wondering given your experience with the sheriff's association what was how were you struck by his testimony So it's like any group of people, the sheriffs vary. And I find, and- um, but He was sent there by the association. Like he was not, ran, we did not cherry pick him. They right. sent him. But the point being is that um, in some of the rural counties, just because the smaller population and you know there might be uh, kind of more repeat offenders, the sheriffs may know their, uh, there, there are folks that they encounter better, you know, I mean, you take a county like Alameda, the sheriff can't know uh, 
whatever, all the people that go in and out of his jail. But the rural counties, some of them do. And so there's, there's a more, depending on the person, a kind of more compassion or familiarity or whatever. So that we have some rural counties where you, you, we don't have sheriffs, at least, you know, because sheriffs change too, but we have some rural counties where we have sheriffs that aren't really into uh, uh, rehabilitative programs and other counties where they really, really are. And uh, so, I mean, I was, I thought it was great what he was describing. I did think it was great. Um, but it's like everything we deal with in this situation, it's, there is, um, I think it was Judge um, Moreno who mentioned uh, judicial uh, con uh, sort of the independence well, of variation, well, diversity. Yes, yes, yes. And and yeah. I think while there's, uh, you know, you can make once we get the data, I'm sure we'll be able to make some kind of assumptions around certain cultural things in county X or county Y. It is somewhat dependent on the personalities too. In other words. Who the DA is, who the sheriff is, uh, just who the judges are, and that when they change, some of that can change also. So of course, we we're not going to have the luxury of being able to design whatever our policies are based on uh, hoping that personality X or Y will change in county X or Y. We're going to have to design it in the way that we think will will achieve, you know, the as the most of the objectives that we have in mind, but I think it is that that human reality of that. It uh, depends on the person. Sometimes the uh, the attitude towards um, you know what what is provided for in their facilities and the attitude towards rehabilitation and the whole bit. So I just looked it up. The population of Butte County is is two hundred thousand. Um, Assembly member Kamlager Dove or and or uh, Judge Espinoza, can you reflect, I guess, did what the sheriff from Butte say resonate at all and, and Senator Skinner's reservations going from 200,000 to a county of whatever, how many? 20? 10 million. 20 million? 10 million. 10. Oh, 10. Sorry. 4,000 uh, square miles. So, I mean, of course they're divided up, right? So different, ca but did, I was, I was just curious about, were, were you shaking your head and saying, that's great for Butte, but this is no relevance to LA or no, that's actually. No, I mean, th there's been a, a, a program, of, um, I forget what it's called, but an educational program in the LA County Jail that was launched by Sheriff Baca. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know what any of the data is regarding success, but I know that a lot of the inmates participate in, in those educational based, education based incarceration, what it's called. We also have in LA County for the very first time, a residential drug treatment program within the county jail for inmates who have SUD. Um, and so I think it is relevant even to the larger jurisdictions, but it's always, you know, it's always a question of funding. And, and do they, and is the alternative custody program run by the jail, run by the sheriffs? It is run by the sheriff in the sense that they, they oversee it, but most of the, the services are provided by contractors, right? So the education part is provided by a school district in, in the San Gabriel Valley. Um, and then some of the other community-based providers come in and do um, the drug treatment stuff, um, Interestingly enough, Los Angeles County is kind of a, a microcosm of the state. The north part of the county is kind of a rural sort of um, conservative place as compared to, you know, some other parts of the county. Um, and is the sheriff, I, did, I wasn't clear also from what we heard yesterday, is the, sh the sheriff given sort of carte blanche to do these alternative programs and that the sheriff's office completely runs them, designs them, or is there some sort of state statute that does it? I don't know the answer to that. Assembly member Kamala Gurdav? Well, so it's always curious to me how, you know, when we're in these kinds of sessions, 
um, sheriffs and other folks seem to say something very different from what they say when they come before us to testify on bills, you know. Um, always, always intrigued um, by that. Um, and no one is ever really interested in, you know, giving a policy the benefit of the doubt to see how it works. It's also really important to note that folks, it's not just the judges and the DAs, it's the probation and it's sort of the political environment of those communities. I mean, we've seen so many things kind of ricochet just based on what's happening, you know, either in that county or in the state and how it's resonating. And so how to not develop policy a based on anecdote for but also in response to those things which we know are kind of cultural and temporary um but i just it's very challenging for me because of course i use this through the lens of los angeles county and see all of the challenges that we're dealing with um there um and to the judge's point there are way there are very different things that are happening for example in palmdale than are happening in um inglewood than are happening in you know riverside which is right next door i mean you they're just places where you don't want to go because you don't want to deal with that particular um court culture but that also has a direct effect on the data that you're getting in terms of how folks are treated and how long they're being sentenced and where they're going and what programs are being offered. Some places are kind of don't want to offer. I mean, you have certain DAs that don't even want to offer certain programs or are very resistant to even giving those things some consideration. And so it's like, how do you have pierced through that? Um, and once again, I think it goes back to culture as well as how you incentivize or how you punish. I could certainly speak to that. Uh, I'm sure Judge Espinoza as well, um, that different courthouses within LA have dramatically different outcomes. And um, I was wondering if Rakin and Mia's data broke it out you know, to that level. Certainly we hope to get that kind of data. Um, so, um, all right, uh, other reactions to the third panel? or priorities to identify for the staff? Mike, I thought it was worth mentioning the information that Mr. Callahan brought about the number of people admitted to CDCR with the short sentences. I know that blew you away, so. Oh, uh, right, I forgot yeah. about that. What was it, 37,000? Somewhere in that neighborhood. That. It was much higher than I think we anticipated. So, and was it less than a year? So yeah, okay, we, sorry, thank you. Okay, can everybody just focus on this for a second? 37,000, so of the entire prison, the entire prison population is just over 100,000. So let's call it a little bit less than a third, between a quarter and a third, hit CDCR with less than a year to serve. Now they might have served five years in county jail waiting for their trial or whatever, but and then CDCR, despite I think what uh, Mr. Callahan said, is really not set up, as far as I'm concerned, and I think we need a little bit more information to hold people for a year or less. The reception process that we discussed is lengthy and expensive. Um, the assignment to different prisons is another whole thing. The waiting list for programming, that you're completely separated from your community because you can be in Susanville from um that seems to be especially with short sentences probably you know i'm guessing not public safety enhancing i'm also guessing financially not uh a good deal tom i think that you had mentioned however that there was a bill getting back to the incentives that said um it was kind of a trade right we hear about these very long sentences in county jails under realignment, which by the way, didn't come up yesterday, which I thought was kind of interesting. You hear anecdotally, especially in the community about people sentenced to 10 years in county jail, but it didn't come up. We didn't ask, but it didn't come up. We should look into that. And that CDCR was gonna take those guys and in exchange give back to the counties, the people that had shorter sentences, 
right? It's kind of a trade, but that, that didn't go anywhere. Is that right, Tom? That's right. It was, it was a while ago. I think it was one or two years after realignment when I think um, perhaps some of that adjustment period was happening and, and perhaps the local sheriffs were afraid of those high, those long sentences filling up the jails. I've asked the Sheriff's uh, Association for that and they're providing it. It's just, um, you know, given the current circumstances, taking a little bit longer than usual. Um, but I, and I do think that data will be uh, still relevant because as you said, Judge Espinosa, I think the AB 109 folks are um, people who are least likely to be affected by the, some of the early releases that are going on. Um, so that's in progress. There is some data in the memo from 2016 and I, you know, it's, I'll, I'll, I'll pull it up, but it's, you know, we're talking a few thousand people statewide doing more than five years in jail. And of course in jail, you're likely to get 50% credit. So, um, you know, those sentences, you look at actual time served, they're going to be shorter than that. But I will say there was one person who was sentenced to something like 40 years in LA County jail. And that just seems absurd, but also a black swan that shouldn't really be the basis for much probably statewide policy. Um, Senator Skinner, do you, are, are you familiar with this issue and do you remember that bill that didn't apparently pass about the long jail sentences and the short prison sentences? Um, yeah, but I, I remember mostly the details around the um, long jail sentences, but I think I didn't really appreciate until we heard that um, yesterday how many folks in CDCR are there for such a short period of time. And that does seem like a, I don't know, I, I, I hesitate to say this, but um, when we get the data on the, um, on the study, you know, I wonder if the crimes that were looked at were any of the crimes that uh, where a person is spending five years in the county jail. I wonder if we looked at, so a five year stint in county jail versus a five year stint in state prison, what's the difference of outcome there? Um, but the short term stint seems to, if, if there are data, to indicate that no, you're much better off in county jail. So maybe we should be shifting this whole notion that uh, it should be based on the uh, the offense, maybe it should be based on time. And uh, if you're, once you're sentenced, if you've already served, you know, so much time in county jail because whatever, you're in that holding pattern. And so that even if your offense was well, whatever, more, you know, not an, a realigned offense, if you're only going to end up for less than a year in state prison, maybe those are the population we should have in county jail instead. I don't know, but that's, I think that's worth it for us to look at. I mean, when they're looking to close count state prisons, and that means reducing like three or 4,000 people. More than that, more than that. Oh, right, 5,000 people, let's say. When well, they have 37,000 a year coming for this short a period of time, mm -hmm. it seems like, Anyway. Right. And the whole thing of, you know, now our orientation to the state prisons trying to be really rehabilitative and really providing programming, you don't get programming if you're only there a few months, especially if three months of it is intake. So you don't get any. So yeah, it's not just three months intake, you're transferred from facility to facility. Right. You know, the, it, the first mm -hmm. six months to a year in prison is, you know, bumping around. Um, they're really, as far as I can concern, if I, as far as I can tell, designed for holding people for very long periods of time. I'd like to, maybe we'll hear more about that, especially we get into long sentences. They, they do seem to be, you know, sensitive to this, right? You know, he was very quick to talk about the MCRP, that, which is the Male Community Reentry Program and the Alternative to Custody Program. But as I said, that's, those, are, those are small, and maybe we should continue to encourage that. And maybe instead of going to jail, especially if this is politically, they go to directly to an MCRP, you know, which is staffed and run by prison, but in the community, mm -hmm. right? We want to, I think that we need to figure out, think that getting back to the data, is it the proximity of where you're housed? Is it the, the agency that's running it? Is it, you know, 
what are the factors, but that was a, a massive number to me. And it also part of the reason why, and this is sort of, I guess, summing up everything from yesterday, why we want to tackle short sentences. It is, it's not the headline grabbing stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not the 17 year old kid who's, you know, didn't know he was in the car and ended up involved in a, you know, felony murder situation. But it is the vast majority of churn of people in the justice system, how they get in the system in the first place, perpetu you know, and then, you know, downward spiral. Um, it's an opportunity for intervention. Um, it affects way more people across the board in the communities, these short sentences. Um, they're super complicated. Well, and it also, it affects, it affects their income, not only for short term, but permanent, it affects their family, it affects more people, more kids in foster care, all of that. And certainly long prison sentences do too, but at least a long prison sentence, again, not to, I don't mean to in any way argue for them, but at least then they're, the family knows they have to uh, figure out some other uh, economic means and the children have, you know, there's ability to at least if there's other relatives to, you know, to accommodate those children more long term. This short stuff has, I think, probably the most serious impacts in terms of other aspects of quality of life. Right. And I, I mean, think in terms of, agreed. And I think in terms of, and not only that, in terms of the number of Californians affected, I mean, I'd like to know that number, but I, I, several orders of magnitude more. Um, and again, it's so complicated. It's so jurisdictional specific. It's even courthouse specific as we were discussing today. Um, in some ways, I think that this might be some of the areas in the penal code that this committee might have the most value. We're gonna hear a lot about long sentences. They're gonna be experts about LWAP, experts about three strikes, experts about gang enhancements. These, those are very well thought through, no, well known sentences that deserve attention and reform. These other things, the mixed sentences, the jail, probation, alternative, oh, it's complicated stuff. And I hope that we can dig in because I think it, it, it has a, a tremendous impact both, as you were saying, Senator Skinner, in all these different ways for individuals, but in terms of just the sheer number of people. So um, that said, is there any, I have a kind of a little running list of what I'll call priorities for further development, but does anybody have anything more to sum up from what we're calling the new business part of the day from yesterday? Can I mention one thing, Mike, real quick? Yeah. Uh, on, sort of on what you were just talking about and what you were saying as well, Senator Skinner, and I know as soon as I say the word credits, everyone wants to back away because, you know, it, it's so complex. But when we're talking about these short sentences, um, you know, I think even a small shift in the credit system can really have big impacts. And when you multiply that over the number of cases we're, we're talking about, I think they can really be um, significant. Um, and there are disparities between jail and prison and people will want to go from one to the other for that reason. Um, you know, I know in uh, public, big, bigger public defender offices will have an unwritten policy. We want to keep our people in jail because you're going to get better credits there than you will if you go to prison. And it, I think that just skews a lot of the system too. And maybe that makes sense, but um, it doesn't seem, um, you know, should be something that goes unexamined. And on the mental health tip, uh, you know, perhaps one hair I can offer on the elephant to continue the metaphor um, has to do with folks who are uh, in the Department of State Hospitals because they've been found incompetent to stay on trial, which, you know, is probably a good proxy for people with some of the most severe uh, florid mental illness. I mean, these are people who have been determined they don't really understand what's even happening. Whether that standard makes sense in the 21st century is a discussion we'll need to have at another time. But uh, if you're in DSH, you get no good conduct credit. So you're going to do more time incarcerated than if you were in jail without a mental health I issue for the same offense. Um, so that's at least one perhaps small way the committee could directly try to address some of that through the technical 
uh, you know, actuarial scary thing of, of credits. Um, so I just yeah. wanted to offer that up. Um, great. Here's my uh, list of summaries and sort of laundry list for you, Tom. Um, starting in order from our conversation. I think that in general, there seemed to be support for exploring incentive programs in general. Um, 678, expanding that or not in other contexts, mental health. Um, I'm curious about what other states have done. We can't be the only state that have thought about this. Um, we said over and over and over, we need, so item two, better data. We'll talk about that in the administrative piece of that, but we want, you know, data and to further interrogate the data or talk with uh, Mia and Rake and some more and, and maybe be collaborative with them. Um, with regard to the second panel, uh, Judge Espinosa, and I think we all agreed, uh, mental health, mental health, mental health is especially acute in these short sentences and that perhaps we also need a deeper dive with what's going on in LA with Judge Espinoza um, and really understand what's going uh, on there. Uh, and, and that tags on with the collaborative course piece. Um, the last panel, um, I know we're working with the sheriffs, but to try to get a better understand of sheriff practices in different counties and the impact of realignment. Um, and then I also had, um, I don't think that we had a, a good enough grasp on the costs and time and process of the reception centers. This is getting to the 37,000. And what does that story look like a little bit, you know, from getting off the bus to prison to getting your permanent assignment of housing? How much does that cost? How long does it take? Do you get any rehabilit? You know, the first year of CDCR incarceration, and then finally, I think that you're right that the credits, especially the disparity in credits between jail and prisons, mm -hmm. that's something that deserves um, consider uh, better understanding. Are there any other priorities or research points that we think that would be helpful for Tom to get back to us on? Can I share one thing real quick that uh, will be res a little bit responsive to uh, something Senator Skinner brought up and um, about Butte County. I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, this is uh, a resource I go to. It, it sort of breaks down um, by county and lots of other ways of looking at it. You know, the rate of incarceration, how many people are sending people to prison. Um, and you can see Butte is right here. I just wanted to offer that up. I know Senator Skinner was offered and interested in some of those county disparities. So this is one way of thinking about it. So they're um, higher than the California average, which is down here and higher than a little bit higher than Los Angeles. So I just thought that might be interesting. If anybody wants to see any other counties, let me know. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. Uh, Los Angeles is that far away from the average. That is striking. Yeah, LA is at 608. Let's see what the average is. Yeah, 486. I'd... Yep. The only reason why I say that is because they drive the average. So if you took California out, it would be even higher. Oh. Yeah. So can you explain that data to me? I don't I don't get the point. Are we sending more people than other counties? Per, yes. Per, yes. Per population? Yeah, it's per uh, 100,000 adults um and it's older data it's from 2016 but you know um it's what we got. It's changed yeah. yeah and you know this is this is That's our data story <laughs> uh you know and you see you know alpine lowest at 126 which is perhaps not surprising but um yeah and they you know they have other ways of breaking it down so uh, this is something i i come to quite often and thought it might and, and be interesting obviously there might be more crime in these different counties right that would account for uh, i Yes, here's the reported crime rate. So Whoa. yeah, you can see Butte has a similar place, but your hometown is at the yeah, highest. Not, not doing good. It's the only one that's got a black bar. That, but that, I think if you're a statistician, that means it's super serious. So you don't see black bars too often. Um, 
I have to keep my kids inside more often. Um, <laughs> we should be doing that anyway, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I do want to sort of keep us moving. Um, we've been going for uh, an hour and we, let's, let's take a quick five minute break and then uh, we'll get to the old business uh, from Tom. Okay. So I have uh, 10.50 and 10.55 promptly log back on, please. <laughs>